the telescope was really the machine that changed the world the most. And what's so cool about it, it, it acted like a lever that moved the Earth from being the center of the universe back in Galileo's time. What year did they invent it? The telescope was invented around the early 1600s. And there's a popular misconception that Galileo invented it, but he, he didn't. He actually perfected it. So he took it from like, you know, zero to one. This is the best Christmas gift you could possibly get a kid. Because with it, you can see the same craters on the moon that Galileo saw. Light pollution does not obscure the, you know, the planets. Light pollution does not make impossible. I'm not advocating for light pollution, but I'm just saying right here in the middle of Austin or in the middle of San Diego, I can see the exact same things that caused Galileo to realize that the sun is the center of the solar system using scientific reasoning and evidence based on observation. He realized he discovered another solar system a system in which there was a massive gravitating object, Jupiter, and around it were orbiting satellites, were orbiting moons around it. Today they're called the Galilean satellites. He actually named them after his benefactor, those patrons, the Medicis, who were the richest you know, people in, in that part of northern Italy. So he named, he was clever, right? He was trying to curry favor. Sure. With them. Uh, maybe this, it would be like if we named the, uh, the you know, whatever, the Higgs boson, we named that after, you know, the European, uh, you know, ta equivalent of the IRS, right? Right. Uh, he was kind of a kiss ant, a kiss up, you know, in some ways, sycophant. But it had to save his life and he needed money and so forth. Right. But when he drew that, he realized, the wait a second, the Bible and all teaching heretofore said there is only one center to the solar system, and it's, and, and it's the Earth, not the sun. This is called geocentrism. Everybody believed that. Aristotle, uh, Plato, everybody had believed that for a long time because it said it was natural that heavy things should fall towards a center, and the center that everything seemed to fall towards was the center of the Earth or the Earth itself. Therefore, the Earth must be the center of the universe. Remember, the solar system was the universe for a long time, then for an equally long time almost, the galaxy was the whole universe, and now there's the universe and maybe the multiverse that we'll talk about. Mm. So this was just incredible realization to him. Imagine like you come upon this thing and you realize you're the first person in human history ever to feel that. Is there any uh, documentation of his struggle with trying to convey these ideas to people that had very strong religious beliefs? Yeah. Because obviously it, it turned out to be a catastrophe for him. That's right. But what did he did he convey in his writing the frustration that he had? He was he's such a fascinating person. I always make a provocative statement that like we don't need English departments, we should just teach like physics and astronomy because some of the great scientists of history, men and women, were tremendous orators, they were tremendous writers and they could convey things through the written word that was pure artistry and mastery. And Galileo would say things like, I do not believe that the same God who has given us senses to understand the world would require that we not use that, and I'm butchering the quote, not use them in order to better understand it. He would mm. write things that he had discovered things, um, you know, only as a way to open a portal into the universe such that minds more astute than mine may be able to walk through this portal. And he was being a little falsely hum um, humble. But uh, Newton was the same way. Newton would write as a great or So you can learn a lot from scientific writing. So therefore, if you only had to choose one thing, I would take the books of Galileo. And this geocentric version of the universe that they've... How, how is it written in the Bible? Like, how do they describe... It's actually, you know, the atheist, so I, I, I call myself a practicing agnostic, which I can define later if you like. But you had on my friend Stephen C. Meyer, which is, you know, partially the reason that I'm here, I think. Um, but, uh, but to have the discussion about, uh, you know, the influence of religion on science. And he made the claim that without religion, we wouldn't have science on this show a couple of weeks ago. In other words, we wouldn't have the, the tradition that we can, that the world is intelligible. It's not the capricious will of gods, you know, uh, playing with human beings as Greeks and, and others had, had identified. Um, so the, uh, the, the notion of, you know, how religious a scientist could be or how religion impacted him was very clear. He would say he was a very religious person. In fact, two of his daughters were nuns. And um, because of his... Um, you know, I always say, like, imagine we're living in a time where someone like Anthony Fauci or, you know, Francis Collins or somebody, that they had, they were not only the scientists, the expert scientists, say, but they also controlled the government. In other words, the most powerful force on Earth at that time, at least where Galileo was, was the Vatican. 
he never left Italy. He never left w- w- uh, Italy didn't exist back then, by the way. They were always city states, right? Tuscany and Ven- Venice and, and Rome and so forth. But the, the notion it was a Catholic you know, band of jurisdiction and Catholic Church had sway over that part of Italy and Tuscany where he was. He was very religious, um, but he he thought that he could say things like if he proved that something scientifically was true, he didn't understand why that couldn't be part of the religious canon. So he was surprised. In other words, he, he felt that the signature of God is truth. So if he discovered truth, it wouldn't be a problem for the It wouldn't be threatening. Mm. But I argue back then... It was kind of threatening. Like, if you started having a bunch of people say, oh, the Bible's wrong, we've been misled, and they're the government, not just scientific authority, they're the government, um, it could lead, I'm not saying it's good, but it could lead them to want to suppress that, right? Because mm-hmm. it could lead to insurrections, it could lead to whatever, um, and, and rebellions. And that could be perceived as very threatening to the state. 